Almog Levy celebrated his third birthday with his family this summer, although celebrated is actually not the best word to describe the occasion. As so often since October the 7th, he asked where his mum and dad were, and he asked when they would be coming home. But on that fateful day last October, his mother, Anyav, was killed, and his father, Orr, taken hostage by Hamas gunmen as they hid in a shelter at the Supernova Music Festival. Almog's uncle Michael has committed his life to securing the release of his younger brother, Orr, and he joins me now in Washington. Michael, thank you for making the time. Now, I'd like to talk uh, about your, your nephew, Almog, or Moggy as he's known, in just a little while, but tell me first about his parents, your brother Orr. Give, paint a picture of them for me. I guess you, you can call them the perfect couple. Uh, they used to be the perfect couple. Uh, they met about 50 years ago. At first, they were uh, very good friends, part of the same group of friends. And I've even had a different boyfriend when they met. Um, and then they became friends and they started hanging out together all the time. And, you know, after a while, uh, we all knew that, that, they are, that it's about to happen. My mother actually asked him, oh, why don't you date enough? And he just told her, no, I can't date enough. She's like my sister. And then a few months after, uh, they started dating, and from that day on, they were never apart. Uh, they loved traveling, they loved music festival. It was kind of like the new Israeli dream. And that's the interesting thing. You've always described uh, them as soulmates. You said that Niav was like uh, all soulmates. Exactly. I mean, she, she was his whole life. Uh, um, they did everything together. They went to music festivals together, they traveled the world together. They were never apart, like I said. Having known each other that long and being so close, uh, what was it like when little Moggy came along and suddenly they were parents? At first we thought it will change things, but they actually did the same things just with him this time. Uh, they flew everywhere with him. They were, I think like, few months before well, October 7, they went to Thailand with him and they had a lot of fun together. So before that, that fateful day, October the 7th, it literally was all flowing very, very nicely then. Uh, yeah, like uh, it was like a dream, I think. Then of course, everything changed the next day. Um, they'd headed to that uh, Supernova mu Music Festival. Um, and as with many things in life, timing can prove to be, you know, quite, quite tragic. Um, how did the events, from what you know of everything, how did the events unfold for Anyav and Or? They actually got to the uh, Supernova Festival at 6.20 a.m. It was nine minutes before uh, the attack started. And from not, what I know, they immediately ran from the, the, the area. They all t actually texted my mother that they are heading back. And, but from what I know now, they wanted to turn left, which is the way to their home. Uh, but the road was closed, uh, so they had to turn right and run uh, the drive south. Uh, then they had to run into a bomb shelter because of the missile attack. And from that day, that second on, uh, everything uh, went crazy. They got into this bomb shelter, squeezed in together, together with 27 others. I'm not sure if you saw those uh, bomb shelters, uh, but it's basically a bus stop made out of concrete with not even a door. Uh, it's a tiny one. Uh, from inside, I called my mother. It was 7.39 a.m. You're completely terrified. He just repeated the sentence, Mom, you don't want to know what's going on here. And 10 minutes after, the terrorists arrived to that bomb shelter and sprayed it with bullets, threw grenades, they even fired an RPG into it. And he had to watch Einav being murdered in front of him, uh, together with 17 others, before he was abducted. It's hard to imagine how chaotic things were. How long did, you, did it take you to find out, you and your family, to find out exactly what had happened to them? 
it took us a while. At first, I wasn't too worried because, unfortunately, in Israel, we are used to those missile attacks. So, back, so, so I, I kept telling myself, okay, they will be fine. It's just a missile attack. They will hide in a bomb shelter and then head back. And uh, my mother actually called me at, it was around 8.30 or so. And she was crying. She told me that she was worried and she doesn't know what happened and that all oh, doesn't answer the phone. I was actually angry. And I told her, mom, you you're just uh, thinking bad things. You'll stop thinking uh, about the, the wars because you know, the lines probably fell or something like that. And he will call us very soon. And only at 10, 15, I got a call from my uncle. Uh, he asked me if I know what happened to all and or if we heard something from him. And I told him that they should be on their way back, but uh, I'm not sure. That, Second on, I knew that something really bad happened. It sounds like, you know, you're so used to that, living in that way, that you, you tend to remain optimistic, which is interesting. I think that's, you know, kind of how I try to see everything. Uh, I try to be as optimistic as possible because, um, you know, you have too many reasons to be pessimistic in Israel. Now seeing, seeing that video uh, of the attack on that shelter and Oz capture uh, um, must have been pretty difficult, uh, obviously. But you you want the world to see that video. Why is that? Why do you want it to be so public? Um, it took us a while to to decide we want to release it and to show it to the world. But the way I see it is that sometimes the world uh, need a reminder. People need a reminder that they are actually live hostages in Gaza. And I know it's really easy to forget about uh, them, but uh, it's about them. It's not about politics or the war or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's about human beings. It's, it's very difficult to imagine what this last last year would have been like for you. I mean, it's it's gone on way longer than most people could have imagined. And I'm wondering, you know, emotionally, how trapped you feel in that moment because things haven't moved on after so long. So I, I keep saying that uh, people ask me, what are you going to do on October 7th? Or how do you intend to mention it? For me, it's just another day because I still live in October 7th, uh, 2023. And uh, things were stuck there for me. Uh, everything feels like a one long day. Have you, have you become a community with other family members of the hostages. I mean, uh, how does that help you cope? Obviously, if you do get together, it, it's, a, it's a support structure. How have you found that coming together? That's actually one of the positive things, one of the positive things that happened uh, because of it. Uh, they became my family. I can talk to them. They understand me with no words sometimes. And it's helping. And yet, the difficulty is that all of you uh, the families of those waiting, you've had to deal with news, either you, you hope for news of release or you have the tragic news, as, as was the case with the bodies that were found. Yeah, it's terrible. You know, sometimes when they, they are getting released, it's the uh, happiest day you can imagine. And sometimes when we hear horrible news like the six that were executed, that's the most horrific news you can think of. So... In a way, it's like a, an emotional roller coaster. Um, but the amazing thing is that we stay together. Uh, even even the families that got the worst announcement stayed with us, and they keep fighting with us. And that's amazing to see. Conflicts, they have tragedy on both sides quite often. And as you try to cope, and you and the families of the hostages try to cope with the situation on your side, how easy or difficult is it for you to see what's happening on the other side? That, you know, suffering, obviously, some of the Palestinians are going through, many Palestinians are going through. I hate to see anyone suffer, and I keep saying it everywhere, uh, that Hamas didn't just uh, do it to us as Israelis. They did it to his own people. Uh, the, the Palestinians are suffering. 
because of Hamas and the fact that, uh, that Hamas is still there means that everyone will keep suffering. And like I said, I hate to see anyone suffer and I would love to live in peace together with Palestinians if possible. And the only way to do it is to release the hostages and this will end the war. And that's what I think that uh, the world should do, push towards this. One of the issues, Michael, is that often an, uh, a conflict like this just gets seen through the political lens. And I wonder when you see it being pushed into that political lens, how you worry about the other aspects. I mean, how for you, how much is it political? For me, it's not related to politics in any way. You know, obviously I'm not naive. I know the solution has to be to politics somehow, but people have, has to remember that those are human beings. All is a real human being. The rest of the hostages are real human beings with families and hopes and dreams and plans for the future, just like you and I. And although it's very easy to take it into the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it's not about it. It's about human lives. It's about people who just wanted to go and celebrate in a music festival and people who were kidnapped from their beds. This is not war. They didn't want to fight anyone. We all want to live in peace. Most of the hostages are actually peace activists. I want to live in peace with the Palestinians. I don't hate anyone. I just need my brother back and the rest of the hostages back and hopefully we can find a way to live together and in peace. And you've advocated tirelessly for the release of the hostages, including your brother, and you reached out to some fairly prominent people. What's been the response? Who have you reached out to and, and how have they responded? Sometimes I don't even remember because I've met so many influential people, but uh, just to name a few, I've met the Pope, I've met presidents, prime ministers, uh, foreign ministers of any country you can imagine. The response is usually very sympathetic. Uh, they show solidarity. Sometimes they even do things uh, behind the scenes or publicly. Uh, well, honestly, I don't care as long as they are doing something to help and to end the suffering for both sides. I'm fine with it. Uh, if they can help me and get my brother and the rest of the hostages back, I'm fine with any kind of uh, response from them. Do you worry to some degree that perhaps all these people you are meeting, that the politicians are so wrapped up with their own stuff that, that you're being paid a lot of lip service, that more could be done? The, the fact that they are still there means that we all can do more. You know, me personally, the politicians, the media, all of us. Um, so yeah, sometimes I meet people and I know that nothing is going to come up out of it. But I just keep doing it because you never know who will be the one who will make the change or be able to help. You're, we're talking here in, in Washington, D.C., the heart of U.S. politics. And I wonder whether you feel that the U.S. policy on the Israel-Gaza conflict is helping or hindering the situation when it comes to releasing the hostages. Honestly, I don't know what's, what's the right way. Not, you know, not the, the, I don't know what other families should do. I don't know what the politicians should do. I try to wake up every morning and tell myself, uh, ask myself what I should do now. Um, for me, the fact that the hostages are on the agenda means that the world haven't forgotten. And like I said earlier, the only way to solve the issues in the Middle East starts with releasing the hostages. Everything else will happen only when they are released. So this is what I want and this is what we are calling for. It feels kind of frozen to you then, the way things are. Um, I guess. I mean, we, we don't hear anything about negotiations right now, so it is, but uh, we will change it. Now, I understand you've been disappointed by 
the fact that some of the human rights organizations that are out there haven't been able to help you. Explain, explain to me what happened with that. In short, nothing. They didn't uh, meet the hostages. They didn't pass medicine. They, they didn't even meet them. Um, we expected a lot more. We expected them to at least see them and make sure that they are treated. Uh, but unfortunately, it didn't happen. I'm talking about all of them and uh, the Red Cross, you know, all, all the organizations of the UN, uh, none of them did anything. Is it possible that perhaps they don't have the, the ability or access because of the way the conflict has been going? I mean, is the military action, for example, in Gaza perhaps even hindering the chance for them to do that? I don't believe so because they have connections, they have people inside Gaza. And from the discussions we had, for example, with uh, the Red Cross, they prefer to preserve the connections with Hamas and not to hurt them. Uh, and in a way, they give up on seeing what's going on with the hostages in order to keep this, uh, those connections with Hamas. Now, it's interesting because you're saying that that connection that they want with Hamas, you're also saying, you have said, that Hamas has to, to go. Uh, and in the aftermath of October the 7th, the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu actually even said he was determined to wipe out Hamas. Now, I wonder, do you feel you fully understand that? I mean, do you fully understand and support that approach? Or do you think it might actually be a hindrance to progressing the release of the hostages? Oh, I think that the, the way or the order of things should be the opposite. Um, you know, if you ask any normal human being on the street, they understand that Hamas is a terror organization. They didn't just murder Israelis. They murdered Muslims. They murdered a Muslim guy outside of my brother's bomb shelter because he tried to save the others. He spoke to them in Arabic. He told them he was religious and they just abused him and executed him basically so they have to go in order for the Palestinians to live to have a, a chance for a normal life they have to go but we can get the hostages first and then finish the job with Hamas and make them go for the sake of everyone in the Middle East that's what I was wondering is whether it's a case of the Prime Minister of Israel, you know, continuing with this, this uh, military action at the cost of the hostages. I, I don't see it the same way because we have, unfortunately, we have experience with hostages in Gaza for more than 10 years now with no military action. They didn't come back. The Hamas didn't want to negotiate anything about them. So they have to feel some kind of a military pressure. Uh, but yes, I agree that after a certain point, Israel has to get to a deal. And that's what we're calling for. I'm wondering, when you saw thousands of people coming out on the streets and demanding a ceasefire, whether you felt this might be a chance then of a change in the policy that would allow the hostages to be released. Um, yeah, we felt supported. And uh, those hundreds of thousands there on the streets demanded to get back all the hostages before it's too late. And that's what, like I said, that's what we're calling for. How, how do you think Israel's new focus on Hezbollah now uh, will affect the chance of getting all and the other hostages released? I think that everything is connected. And Hezbollah is a completely different issue and it should be solved but once again that's part of the bigger picture if the hostages are back everything can be solved uh, the, the the conflict with hezbollah the conflict with hamas the, basically everything that's going on on the middle east can start recovering only after they are back is it a bit of a catch-22, though, Michael? Because what you have now is you have the Houthis, you have Hezbollah, and then, of course, Hamas continuing its actions. And those others, Hezbollah, Houthis, they're, they're trying to support Hamas because of the military action taking place. So it's almost like 
without any kind of ceasefire, everything is stuck. Uh, yes, uh, but you know, I think that people tend to forget that behind everything there is Iran. They are financing all of them. They are financing Hezbollah. They are, fi they are financing the Houts. They are, fi they, are, they are financing Hamas, obviously. So everything is connected. Uh, but to your question, yeah, I agree. Uh, there has to be a ceasefire, but before we can get to a ceasefire, we need the hostages back. Uh, the order of the thing should be the other way around. So if Prime Minister Netanyahu was sitting in this room with us, what would you ask him to do? Very simple. Get to a deal. Seal a deal. Get the hostages back and then do whatever you need to do with uh, Hamas or Hezbollah or everyone else. Let's get back to your, your little nephew, Almog. How has he coped with the past 12 months? Because it's been almost a year since, you know, he's had a hug from his parents or had any kind of contact. I mean, I, you know, I know it's difficult, but do you, do you do your best to keep the memories of Or and his mum alive? Or are you kind of trying to shelter him a little bit so he doesn't feel the depth of that loss? Oh, the, 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 um, it's very tricky because on one hand, we want him to remember. We want him to know who was his mum. We want him to remember all and know that all is there and he will be back and he is his father. So on one hand, we tell him stories, we show him pictures, we show him videos. But we, on the other hand, we don't want to deal with it too much because obviously he misses them. He wants to see them. He wants to meet them again. Unfortunately, it's not possible with his mom, and we're still fighting to get his father back. And it's even more tricky because, you, you know, as the time goes on, you're passing birthdays and anniversaries again. How do you treat those? Those milestones are the, I think those are the hardest. Uh, he celebrated his birthday alone, and we, we threw him a big party to make him happy, and he was happy. For us, it was uh, one of the saddest days of our lives. But we try to keep him happy and try to treat him like a normal kid. Um, but obviously those uh, milestones uh, that are important in every parent's uh, life are without his parents. You know, talking of anniversaries, you, you said something very poignant uh, a little while ago. You said October the 7th is coming around again, first year anniversary. But for you, it's just another day. I wonder though, do you think there's any chance that when people do have to remember that date as it comes around, that it might create more impetus, more movement for something to be done? Because people now will say it has been a year and there has been a resolution. Now, obviously, you know, this date is, is symbolic and yes, we can and need to use it in order to remind people that there's still no solution, that there are still 101 hostages in Gaza. So, you know, for me personally, it doesn't mean anything. It's just another day, but it is a day that we can use the media attention to remind the world that there are still hostages back, back in Gaza. You know, Mike, like, you know, sitting with you, I can sense, obviously, the depth of the emotion. You know, it's your brother who's been taken hostage. You've lost your sister-in-law, who's his soulmate, and you're now dealing with, uh, you know, looking after his three-year-old son. Um, is there any time that you find it so much, the pressure to be so much that you, you fear that this will never resolve positively, that you might not see or again? How do you, how do you avoid getting into that kind of depth? Um, obviously this, this is somewhere inside my head all the time, but I try not to think about it because for me, there's no other way than him being back. I won't let uh, uh, this amazing boy to grow up without a father. And I promised my parents actually on the second day that I'll bring him back. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'll bring him back. Now, we know that some of the hostages have been able to see news coverage from time to time. So trying to take a, a positive approach on this with the chance that, oh, might have a chance to see this interview, might have a chance to see what's going on. What, what message could you send to him now? It's very simple. I 
try to approach him from time from time to time. Uh, I want him to know that uh, we are looking up for uh, Almog. We'll keep him happy. And I want him to stay strong and uh, know that we are doing everything to bring him back and that we will we'll bring him back. Is there anything you could say to his captors? Uh, I don't waste my uh, time on those monsters. Those are not even human to me. Well, Michael, I wish you luck getting your brother back. And thank you for making the time to talk. Thank you. Thank you.